Radium's Deadly Glow Radium was discovered in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie. Early scientists knew it could kill cancer cells, so they assumed small, controlled doses might energize the body and improve health. By the 1920s, it was sold in tonics, cosmetics, toothpaste, and even chocolate, marketed as a miracle cure for everything from fatigue to impotence. The glow of radium made it look alive, and that glow sold products. The most infamous was Radithor, radium dissolved in water. Wealthy industrialist Eben Byers drank three bottles a day for years, calling it invigorating. But radium builds up in bones, where it continues emitting radiation. The constant bombardment destroys bone tissue from within, causing radium jaw, teeth falling out, skulls riddled with holes. Byers became a gruesome public warning. A 1932 headline summed it up. The radium water worked fine until his jaw came off. His remains were buried in a lead-lined coffin, and they're still radioactive today. Killing by bloodletting. For over 2,000 years, doctors believed illness came from an imbalance of four fluids, the humors. Too much blood was thought to cause fevers, inflammation, <laughs> <laughs> even mental illness. The solution was to remove it. Physicians used knives, glass cups, or leeches to draw it out, calculating amounts based on the patient's age and symptoms. Bloodletting was prescribed for nearly everything. Headaches, pneumonia, broken bones. It was so common that barbers performed it, a fact remembered in the red and white barber pole. Red for blood, white for bandages. The flaw was fatal. Draining large amounts of blood weakens the immune system, causes shock, and can kill. George Washington is the most famous example. In 1799, with a throat infection, his doctors removed nearly 40% of his blood in less than 12 hours. Instead of saving him, the treatment almost certainly hastened his death. Ironically, he might have survived had they done nothing. Life from nothing. For over 2,000 years, scientists and philosophers believe life could appear from non-living matter under the right conditions, called spontaneous generation. It seemed to explain common sights, maggots and rotting meat, mice and grain, frogs after rainstorms. Without microscopes or knowledge of microbes, people assumed life simply formed when heat, moisture, and material combined. Even Aristotle described it as natural law. Recipes for life existed. Mix wheat with dirty rags, wait three weeks, and mice would appear. In the 1600s, Francesco Reddy began challenging the idea, proving maggots came from flies, not meat. Yet belief persisted, especially for microorganisms invisible to the naked eye. The turning point came in 1859, when Louis Pasteur's swan neck flask experiments showed that sterilized broth stayed free of life unless exposed to airborne microbes. The verdict was clear. Life only comes from existing life. What people thought was spontaneous creation was actually reproduction they couldn't yet see. Mars's fake canals. In 1877, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli observed faint lines across Mars and called them canali, meaning channels. When translated into English as canals, it suggested artificial waterways. The idea ignited public imagination. American astronomer Percival Lowell became the theory's most vocal supporter. He mapped over 400 canals, connecting circular oases in geometric patterns he claimed could only be engineered by intelligent Martians. The vision was compelling, a dying world building vast irrigation systems to survive. Books, articles, and even H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds drew from the idea. But the canals were illusions, a mix of telescope limitations and the brain's tendency to connect faint markings into straight lines. As technology improved, no canals were found, only natural surface features. What had seemed like alien engineering was nothing more than human pattern-seeking, projected onto another planet. Witch trials rigged. During Europe's witch hunts and Colonial America Salem trials, courts used tests presented as fair investigations but built to guarantee guilt. The most infamous was trial by water. Bind the accused and throw them into deep water. Floating proved guilt. Pure water would reject witches. Sinking meant innocence, often decided after drowning. Other methods were just as fatal. In the needle test, witch prickers searched for devil's marks, spots that wouldn't bleed when pierced. They often used retractable needles that never pierced the skin, ensuring proof was always found. Touch tests required the accused to to touch a possessed victim. Any change in symptoms was seen as supernatural evidence. These trials operated on circular logic. No outcome could prove innocence. Torture was common and a confession only confirmed guilt. If someone resisted under pain, that was called proof of satanic strength. Beneath the guise of legal procedure, these systems were engineered execution machines. California Island Myth from the early 1600s to mid-1700s, European maps showed California as a massive island separated from mainland North America. The era began after Spanish explorer Sebastian Vizcaino's 1602 coastal survey was misinterpreted by mapmakers. Without overland exploration, it seemed logical. Ships could sail around Baja's tip, so they assumed the water extended north. In 1622, influential cartographer Henry Briggs published a map cementing the island in the European imagination. For over 200 years, it appeared on maps, taught in navigation schools, 
schools, and influenced politics. Spanish colonial planners and even pirates developed strategies based on controlling the supposed channel between California and the mainland. Missionary Eusebio Quino's late 1600s expeditions proved otherwise. He traveled overland and charted California as a peninsula. Despite his evidence, many dismissed his findings as mistakes or lies. It took until 1747 for Spanish authorities to officially declare California part of the continent, ending one of cartography's longest-lasting errors. The Four Humors Trap From ancient Greece through the 19th century, medicine revolved around the theory of four humors. Blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Health meant perfect balance between them. Illness, both physical and mental, was blamed on an excess or shortage of one humor. Each was tied to traits and symptoms. Too much blood meant fevers and restlessness. Excess phlegm brought sluggishness. Yellow bile fueled anger. Black bile caused depression. Doctors diagnosed by appearance and temperament, then prescribed treatments to rebalance. Bloodletting, purging, vomiting, or diet changes. The theory dominated medicine for 1,500 years, shaping everything from surgical timing to marriage arrangements. It persisted because it offered a simple, all-in-one explanation for disease, even as anatomy and science advanced. Modern medicine revealed the truth. Illness is caused by pathogens, genetic issues, or organ dysfunction, not mystical fluid imbalances. Skull bump science. In the early 1800s, German physician Franz Joseph Gall introduced phrenology, the belief that personality, intelligence, and moral character could be read by feeling bumps on the skull. Gall claimed the brain had dozens of organs, each tied to specific traits, and that the skull's shape revealed their size. Phrenology became a cultural craze in Europe and the U.S. Practitioners used calipers to chart skull maps, claiming a bump above the ear meant destructiveness, while a hollow near the forehead meant weak math skills. Families used readings to plan children's education. Courts cited phrenology in criminal cases. Employers screened workers by skull shape. It was pseudoscience, but it influenced psychology, criminology, and even social policy, often in harmful ways, such as justifying racism and discrimination. Modern neuroscience proved there's no link between skull shape and brain function. The bumps were bone structure, not windows into the mind. Flat Earth Roots. In ancient civilizations, the flat earth model was widely accepted because daily life offered no clear evidence of curvature. Mesopotamian, Egyptian, and Norse traditions described earth as a flat disk or rectangle under a solid dome sky. Travel was limited, and there was no need for astronomical proof in daily survival. By the 4th century BCE, Greek thinkers like Aristotle began challenging this view, citing observations such as Earth's curved shadow during lunar eclipses. Still, flat earth beliefs persisted for centuries in regions where religious or mythological models held authority. In medieval Europe, most educated scholars accepted a spherical Earth, but in isolated areas, flat Earth ideas survived due to limited access to scientific knowledge. The belief's endurance wasn't about evidence, it was about worldview. Without global travel, space imagery, or universal education, the spherical Earth was irrelevant to most people's lives. Death by bad air. From ancient Greece through the 19th century, physicians believed diseases like cholera, plague, and typhus were caused by miasma, poisonous vapors from decaying matter. Bad smells were thought to corrupt the blood, so foul air became the focus of prevention. Public health measures targeted odors, draining swamps, clearing waste, and improving ventilation. Some changes accidentally helped, like building sewer systems that reduced disease, not because they removed miasma, but because they eliminated contaminated water sources. The turning point came in the 1850s, when John Snow traced a London cholera outbreak to a single water pump, proving waterborne transmission. Pasteur's germ theory later confirmed that microscopic organisms, not bad air, caused disease. Miasma theory faded, but for centuries it shaped city design, hospital architecture, and public health health policy based on the wrong enemy. Medical Mercury Cures For centuries, mercury, now known as a toxic heavy metal, was used as medicine. Ancient Chinese alchemists believed it could extend life, while medieval European doctors prescribed it for skin diseases and internal ailments. By the 16th century, mercury became the standard treatment for syphilis, often applied as ointment, swallowed in pills, or vaporized for inhalation. Patients endured months of exposure, sweating, drooling, and losing teeth. Symptoms doctors misread as signs the treatment was working. Mercury doesn't just kill bacteria, it also damages the brain, kidneys, and nervous system. Chronic exposure caused tremors, memory loss, and eventually death. The practice persisted into the early 20th century, despite growing evidence of harm. Safer treatments eventually replaced it, but not before generations suffered the slow, irreversible effects of mercury poisoning, all while believing they were being cured. Trepanation for health. Trepanation is the practice of drilling or scraping a hole in the skull. It dates back at least 7,000 years and was used in ancient cultures worldwide. The belief was that opening the skull could release evil spirits, causing illness, seizures, or mental distress. In some cases, it was also thought to relieve pressure from head injuries. Surprisingly, many ancient patients survived, as shown by bone regrowth in excavated skulls. But trepanation was performed without anesthesia, antiseptics, or knowledge of brain function. Infection, bleeding, and brain damage were 
were common. The procedure lingered in parts of the world into the 19th century and has even resurfaced in fringe medical circles today, promoted by people claiming it enhances consciousness by increasing blood flow to the brain. Modern science shows no benefit, only extreme risk, making trepanation one of the oldest and most dangerous medical myths in history. The Dancing Plague of 1518 in July 1518, residents of Strasbourg, then part of the Holy Roman Empire, were struck by a strange compulsion to dance uncontrollably. It began with a single woman dancing in the street for hours, unable to stop. Within a week, dozens joined her. By the end of the month, the number had grown to around 400. Contemporary accounts describe people collapsing from exhaustion, breaking bones, and even dying from strokes or heart attacks, yet still moving in spasms. Local authorities believed the dancers were afflicted by supernatural forces or divine punishment. Instead of stopping the gatherings, they hired musicians and built a stage, thinking the afflicted would dance it out. Modern theories suggest the cause may have been mass hysteria, triggered by stress, famine, and disease, or poisoning from ergot fungus, a hallucinogenic mold found on damp rye bread. Whatever the cause, the event lasted for weeks before fading, leaving one of history's most baffling and deadly public health mysteries. Lead Makeup Beauty For centuries, pale skin was a status symbol in Europe, associated with wealth and nobility. To achieve it, women and men used cosmetics made from lead carbonate, known as Venetian ceruse. The makeup provided a smooth, porcelain-like finish and could cover scars or blemishes. Users didn't know that lead absorbs through the skin and accumulates in the body. Prolonged use caused hair loss, rotting teeth, skin ulcerations, and neurological damage. Some wearers' faces became so damaged they applied even more lead makeup to hide the effects, accelerating the poisoning. One famous victim was Elizabeth I of England, who reportedly relied on lead-based cosmetics for decades, possibly contributing to her declining health in later years. Lead makeup remained popular into the 19th century, its dangers hidden beneath a mask of beauty, a slow, elegant form of poisoning. The Hollow Earth Theory in the late 17th and 18th centuries, some scientists and explorers believed the Earth was hollow and possibly inhabited inside. The idea was popularized by figures like Edmund Haley, who proposed that the planet consisted of concentric shells with an inner sun. Later, in the 19th century, writers such as John Cleve Sims Jr. claimed there were massive openings at the poles leading to inner continents. Expeditions were proposed, and in some cases attempted, to find these polar entrances. Advocates believed the interior could house lost civilizations, strange animals, or a person perfect climate. The theory persisted because Earth's deep interior was unknown and polar exploration was limited. Advances in geology, seismology, and polar mapping eventually proved Earth's interior is solid rock and molten metal, not empty space. Still, the hollow Earth theory remains a fringe belief today, blending pseudoscience with conspiracy culture. The Cardiff Giant Hoax In 1869, workers digging a well in Cardiff, New York, uncovered what looked like a 10-foot-tall petrified man. Newspapers hailed it as proof of biblical giants, and thousands paid to see it. The Cardiff Cardiff Giant became a sensation, drawing crowds from across the country. In reality, it was a carved gypsum statue, buried a year earlier by George Hull, an atheist looking to mock religious literalists. Hull had the figure sculpted, aged with acid and pigment, then planted on his cousin's farm. The hoax worked so well that even after scientists declared it fake, some visitors refused to believe the truth. The statue was eventually sold to showman P.T. Barnum, who made a replica when denied the original. Barnum's copy attracted even more attention, leading to a bizarre legal dispute over which giant was the real fake. Today, the Cardiff Giant sits in a museum, a monument to gullibility and the power of a good story. The Moon Was Made of Cheese The idea that the moon was made of cheese appears in European folklore dating back at least to the Middle Ages. In many versions, it wasn't meant as a scientific claim, but as a cautionary tale about gullibility, like the story of a fool who mistakes the moon's pockmarked surface for a wheel of cheese. However, before modern astronomy, some people did take the comparison literally. Without telescopes, the moon's pale color and mottled texture resembled certain cheeses common in medieval diets. In rural communities where observational science was limited, such visual analogies could pass as fact. By the 17th century, early telescopes revealed craters and mountains, debunking the cheese myth for good. Still, the phrase, the moon is made of green cheese lingered in popular speech as a metaphor for believing something obviously false. It remains one of the most enduring examples of how visual similarity can fuel mistaken belief. The Great Cat Massacre In 18th century France, apprentice printers in Paris carried out a bizarre event now known as the Great Cat Massacre. Cats were seen as pests in workshops, but also as symbols of bad luck, witchcraft, and even social inequality, because wealthy households pampered their pets while workers lived in poverty. According to an account by one apprentice, workers staged a mock trial accusing the cats of various crimes, then executed them in a public spectacle. 
The act was both a cruel prank and a form of protest against their masters. Killing cats was believed to purge bad fortune and send a message of defiance. Today, historians interpret the massacre as a window into the tensions of pre-revolutionary France, where superstition, resentment, and dark humor collided. It also illustrates how symbolic animals could become targets for social unrest. The Piltdown Man Hoax In 1912, amateur archaeologist Charles Dawson announced the discovery of fossilized skull fragments in Piltdown, England. The find appeared to show a human-like skull with an ape-like jaw, the missing link between apes and humans. Scientists hailed it as one of the most important discoveries in human evolution, and it fit perfectly with the expectation that early humans had large brains and evolved in Europe. For over 40 years, the Piltdown Man was taught as fact. Museums displayed reconstructions, and textbooks used it to support theories about human origins. The fraud unraveled in 1953, when new dating techniques revealed the skull was a modern human cranium paired with an orangutan jaw, stained to look ancient and filed down to fit. The hoax embarrassed the scientific community and became a cautionary tale about confirmation bias, the tendency to accept evidence that supports what we want to believe while ignoring signs of fraud blood transfusions from animals. In the 17th century, scientists experimenting with blood transfusion believed animal blood could cure human illness or alter personality. Sheep were the most common donors, chosen for their perceived gentleness. Doctors claimed transfusing sheep blood into an aggressive person could make them calmer. Jean-Baptiste Denis in France performed one of the first recorded animal-to-human transfusions in 1667, giving a feverish boy a small amount of lamb's blood. The boy survived, and Denis declared the experiment a success. But later attempts ended in severe illness and death due to immune reactions and infections. By the late 1600s, the practice was banned in France and England, but it remains a striking example of how limited medical knowledge, combined with symbolic thinking, led to dangerous and deadly treatments.